Good morning and welcome to Press Corner here on TVP World. I'm Conrad Gorlinski. Well, our weekly a Sunday chat about the past week's key events uh, with our colleagues in the media here in the Central and Eastern Europe. It's our time to take a breath, uh, take a step back and separate facts from rhetoric. Our top stories for this week are, of course, the continuing dispute between European and Ukrainian farmers. We'll also take a closer look at politics in Hungary and corruption allegations against Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban and his Fidesz party, which have recently come to light. And finally, we'll review some of the changes in public opinion with respect to the severity of Europe's security situation. My guests today are a journalist from Radio Free Europe, Rostislav Hotin, and ICTV host Gregory German. We're still waiting for him to arrive, uh, but hopefully he'll join us uh, very shortly. So, uh, Mr. Hotin, uh, thanks uh, very much uh, for taking the time today. I was Next year, you'll be taking the most holy day of the Christian calendar uh, out of your schedule to talk with us. Thankfully, today, uh, it's not a holiday in Ukraine as it is uh, here in the in the Catholic world. Yes, this year Orthodox celebrate in May. Yes, that's true. All right, but as we were discussing, next next year you will be joining the 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 Western European calendar, however you want to look at it. But you'll be joining the calendar uh, that we have out here. Yes, uh, next year the Easter for both Catholics or Protestants and Orthodox will coincide. It will celebrate it in the mid uh, uh, April All right. on the same day. Well, that, that'll be. I look forward to that. All right. Well, let's get to, to our first story uh, for this morning, and it's of course uh, the issue of Ukrainian agricultural products entering EU markets and causing quite a stir among local farmers here. Now, here's a quick report uh, of the latest deals made on an EU level. After farmers' protests disrupted the peace of the European cities and roads, Brussels have reached an agreement to settle the dispute, which was causing rifts between Kyiv and its allies. The deal was extended until the first half of 2025. However, it is not the most favorable for Kyiv. According to Ukrainska Pravda, it will cause Ukraine to lose over $300 million. But what is this agreement? Why it is important for Ukraine and why it is causing disputes in Europe? The free trade deal, officially called the Autonomous Trade Measures, allows Ukraine and the EU to trade without tariffs, duties and export quotas. It was adopted by the EU after the beginning of Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine. And it favors Ukrainian entrepreneurs who feel the pinch of the Kremlin's invasion. But on the other hand, it led to an influx of cheap Ukrainian grain products on the EU market and served as one of the reasons why thousands of farmers became very vocal about the issue. I don't have enough money to keep producing. How long can you produce at a loss? The last two years have been difficult, but the price of grain has remained more or less stable, while every farmer is wondering if it makes sense to go out and sow. Weeks of protests bore fruit during the latest EU summit in Brussels. Member states were about to add oats, maize, honey, poultry and eggs to the list of imported products, considered sensitive. Unfortunately for Ukraine, on the same day, Poland and France said that these safeguards weren't enough to protect their farmers. The two states and their allies demanded that wheat be added to the list of sensitive products. The agreement still awaits ratification by the EU Parliament. If approved, the safeguards could prompt Poland, which imposed a unilateral ban on Ukrainian grain imports last year, to lift it. All right, so still a huge item of contention, uh, especially, and, and it's really destroyed uh, Polish-Ukrainian relations, uh, this, uh, this whole issue. I wonder, have you been following this issue closely? Yes, uh, yes, of course. Uh, as all Ukrainian journalists or all international journalists who cover Eastern and Central Europe, it's uh, been the issue of discontent between Poland and Ukraine, between allies, especially amid war, uh, that uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine, which lasted already for more than two years, 
and suddenly Poland from being a staunch ally of Ukraine uh, and supporting Ukraine uh, with uh, resources, uh, arms, ammunition, uh, helping Ukrainian refugees, suddenly the Ukrainian-Polish relations have been spoiled with this agricultural issue and protest of farmers in Poland, yes. That's right. And, and so this rhetoric, uh, this rhetoric that uh, the farmers are fighting, that it's, it's the Ukrainian farmers against the Polish farmers. Is this really what's happening? Is it really Polish farmers fighting against Ukrainian farmers? Who profits uh, from this rhetoric? I mean, I, obviously Russia profits from this rhetoric. Um, I wonder if you've looked into it. Is it really Polish farmers fighting against Ukrainian farmers? Or is there something, uh, something bigger here? There is a bigger issue, of course. There is a uh, European Union should be taking into account the whole EU agricultural policies of the European Union, Green Deal, which is uh, with which uh, Polish and uh, farmers and uh, farmers in other European countries are not happy. So it's not farmers against farmers, but uh, also we should take into account the war uh, that uh, uh, Russia has blocked the main. Uh, uh, the, the difficulties for the main export route for Ukrainian grain and agricultural products is uh, a sea route through Black Sea. Where you, uh, Russia withdrew from uh, a grain deal uh, mediated by Turkey uh, last July, in, in mid last year, in July last year. Then Ukraine pushed enormously, you know, like uh, uh, tried to reopen this uh, sea deal without Russia. The sea route pushing back uh, uh, backwards Russian Black Sea fleet, uh, uh, destroying several many uh, Russian ships and kind of cornering Russian Black Sea fleet to the eastern part of, of the Black Sea and reopening this uh, sea route on its own, independently of Russia. And now uh, the success of this uh, uh, export route has been enormous. Ukraine ha has been uh, able to was able to export more than 30 million do uh, uh, tons of agricultural products uh, independently via uh, this uh, Western Black Sea route, independently of Russia, and uh, it's the main export route now for Ukraine. And the main markets for Ukrainian grain and other agricultural products is not European Union, actually, or Poland. Uh, Ukraine does not export to Poland much, to be honest. Uh, it's Middle East, it's China, it's Africa. That's where Ukrainian grain traditionally was uh, go, go, going to. But Russia, uh, Russian aggression disturbed uh, 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 this, this uh, export route, and now Ukraine tries to restore it. So uh, uh, it's not uh, Ukrainian farmers against Polish, against Polish farmers, as we discussed, but we should take into account that Ukrainian farmers are, are, are working in a enormously difficult conditions. A lot of agricultural lands in Ukraine uh, have been uh, occupied by Russia. Uh, many agriculture, a lot of Ukrainian agricultural f f uh, lands have been mined by Russia. It's one of the most mined areas in the world now. A lot of uh, 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 tractors and... Uh, uh, I know a lot of farmers, a lot of farmers, you know, returning to their fields that were, you know, near the front lines, a lot of them returning yes. to their fields and unfortunately losing their legs, losing their lives. Um, yes. it, it's severely mined areas. I remember, I remember being there and... Uh, uh, yeah, I, re I remember seeing these minefields, and a lot of these farmers can't uh, farm their fields yet and, and, until they're demined, and unfortunately, that takes uh, quite some time. I mean, you could yes. try to do it yourself, but uh, I wouldn't suggest that uh, for anyone. Um, so there's that issue. There's also the issue, um, a lot of the farmers here um, are saying that they're not fighting Ukrainian farmers. Uh, they're fighting huge uh, corporate conglomerates um, that have taken over uh, the farming sector in Ukraine um, and that have economies of scale that they just can't compete with, especially since there are the rules imposed on the, the farmers in Ukraine are not the same as those that are in Europe, and therefore they, there's, there's absolutely no way that they can compete with the, the amount of production uh, that uh, Ukraine is capable of. Yeah, that's true. That Ukrainian agricultural uh, structure of Ukrainian agriculture is slightly different from uh, average European EU country, especially Poland, 
where there are many small farmers, like two and a half million or uh, all together with farming kind of uh, uh, workforce in Poland. In Ukraine, it's, there are a lot of uh, private uh, small farmers, but also there are a lot of uh, many um, conglomerates, like uh, international companies who came to Ukraine, who uh, attracted by the old image of Ukraine as the breadbasket of Europe, the agricultural powerhouse of, of Europe. It, and Ukraine has been breadbasket of Europe for decades and centuries even, you know, like it's, it's a traditional agricultural sector, grain harvesting in Ukraine is traditionally was strong. But yes, that's true that uh, Ukrainian agriculture has been dominated by conglomerates, that's true. Uh, some of them are international, uh, some of them are local, Ukrainian, and uh, yeah, Ukraine is not a member of the European Union yet, and of course some uh, rules are, uh, are not uh, applied to Ukrainian agriculture sector, unlike to the EU members, uh, farmers in the EU members, but nevertheless Ukraine is preparing to become a European Union country sooner rather than later, and uh, the, the EU should uh, take into account this and should prepare itself now already that Ukraine uh, will be a EU member, maybe uh, even if, if Ukraine becomes uh, the member of the European Union, uh, there are, should be some kind of restrictions on agricultural exports. That's true, but as I said, uh, Ukraine uh, agricultural exports are very diverse before the war. They were, were very diverse before the war, and Ukraine uh, has been uh, a global agricultural player, not just on the territory of the European Union, uh, and when the EU removed these duties for Ukrainian agricultural exports, trying to help Ukraine during the war, Ukraine was very, very thankful to that, for that. But Ukrainian agricultural uh, vision is quite wider than the, just the EU. It's kind of global uh, agricultural uh, power in terms of what? Beat, it certainly uh, does. I mean, it, it certainly grain, is global. Like, of the 50 sugar, largest food distribution companies in yeah. Europe, I mean, Sunflower we have oil, McDonald's yes. Ukraine Limited, uh, f uh, based in Kyiv. I mean, they're the third largest uh, food distribution company in Europe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in terms of grain, uh, uh, sunflower oil, sugar beet, uh, sugar uh, uh, from sugar uh, from beet root, uh, and other products. That's why Ukraine is a global uh, honey, uh, maize, uh, corn. That's why Ukraine is a global uh, uh, agricultural power. That's true. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I wonder also. I imagine that uh, a, a lot of, um, I mean, a lot of Ukraine's previous clients, uh, the, the clients that Ukraine had uh, prior to the war, I mean, how are they dealing with it? Like places like Egypt, uh, for instance, that that have uh, that have been very dependent on Ukrainian grain. Um, once this Ukrainian grain stopped coming in, I mean, how have they been able to fill the gap? They try to diversify their uh, import uh, sources, and Ukraine was a major player, major supplier of grain to Egypt. Uh, mostly e Egyptian bread in Egypt uh, was made of Ukrainian wheat um, uh, and Ukrainian grain. Uh, and in some uh, c uh, corners of the world, this uh, ability of Ukraine to export uh, grain uh, uh, during the war uh, had uh, serious reper repercussions. For instance, Ukraine was a major supplier of wheat uh, and, and grain in general to countries uh, like Somalia or Sudan or South Sudan. Yeah, I know. And then these countries, countries, you know, they've, 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 unfortunately, they don't, I mean, they're unable to produce uh, the, 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 the kind of it, grain. That, yeah. It's because of hunger and the UN, uh, uh, you know, sounded alarms. It, 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 it kind of can uh, result in the hunger in this country, you know, to worsen situations there. People already are suffering and uh, because of war and conflicts, and here comes hunger, you know, on top of it. So, uh, yeah, exactly. And I wonder, I wonder, like, because I was looking at this, uh, at this too, like, a lot of the, the grain that ended up flooding European markets, a lot of that was still meant just to transit through Europe and perhaps go to the port. Uh, in the Baltic Sea and then move its way down back to the, the previous clients, yeah? But it's, it ended up staying here. And I wonder, I mean, the Europeans are blaming the Ukrainians for this, but I mean, once the grain leaves Ukraine, whose fault is it? 
Um, yes, Ukrainian grain, uh, the, the mostly Ukrainian agriculture uh, uh, export and grain in particular, they use southern corridor to the south. And also uh, there was uh, offer from Romania and Croatia to use this kind of Balkan Adriatic corridor as well. Ukrainian grain should be aimed towards the south, global south. This way is, is very much expected, especially also, but also in Asia, in China. China is a big buyer of Ukrainian grain in, in general of agricultural products from Ukraine. Uh, that's uh, right. And but getting it to China because of this war, I mean, that that yeah. that's a very difficult feat, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, both land uh, route is closed for Ukrainian grain to China, and also sea route, Ukraine uh, uses to the maximum capacity, but it's also dangerous because Russia mined not just land, Ukrainian land and agricultural land, Russia mined also Black Sea quite heavily. So now the uh, export vessels are kind of going uh, near the Romanian and Bulgarian coast and Turkish coast trying to keep as close as possible to the sea uh, uh, shore That's of these right. countries. Yeah, uh, so uh, the success of Ukrainian... And, like, and, and legally, what would happen if, let's say that, that, there, that there's a Ukrainian ship and it's, it's on the coast of Bulgaria, for instance, and it's in Bulgarian waters. If Russia decided um, to attack the Ukrainian ship in Bulgarian waters, that'd be an attack on NATO, wouldn't it? Yes, but uh, the ship is from Ukraine. It's not a Bulgarian Navy ship. Uh, so it's not technically Russia against NATO. It's kind of Russia against Fed countries. First, uh, that's first thing. And the second thing is that, uh, you know, uh, Turkey, Turkey still wants to bring Russia to this grain deal again. Um, as a mediator, but uh, Russia does not want to join this grain deal anymore. Uh, and Russia also thinks about its own grain because Russia is also a big agricultural right. power. Yeah, this and serves this wants... serves them especially. It serves if this serves their producers yeah. because now they have the Chinese market for them. Yeah, uh, yeah. they have and a Russia, land route. Yeah, and Russia Russia also thinks about its agricultural exports and views Ukraine as a competitor. So Russia competes with Ukraine in the agricultural on the agricultural markets of the world. That's right. Even here. Um, I, I'm not sure if we were able to get that on the, on the screen. I don't think we are, but it, it was very clear when, when the grain deal came through, uh, the imports from Ukraine into the EU fell drastically. And then they were very consistent until the grain deal ended. And then all of a yes. sudden, the grain spiked back up. Um, and this is yes. especially maize, flour, and pellets. Um, so it, it was very clear that, uh, that this, this had a huge effect on the amount of grain that ended up finding itself um, in, uh, in Europe. And I also, I just want to underline, you know, for a lot of people who, are, who, you know, who um, succumb to Russian propaganda, uh, saying that uh, Ukrainian farmers and Polish farmers are against uh, the Ukrainians, that they're against, and that uh, and it's trying to sow distrust between the Poles and Ukrainians, um, that a lot of this actually, it does have to do with huge retailers. Um, retailers who refuse to, to allow the grain to go to its final destination, but rather like to keep it in Europe to keep their margins higher. Um, the, there are a lot of economic interests uh, here as well. So we do have to take a look at that. Oh, finally, we have Gregory German joining us. Gregory? Pleasure yeah. to see you, sir. I heard uh, you forgot that there was a change in time, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. This whole daylight time, savings, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it, it's very, it's understandable. I actually, I would have, I wouldn't have, if my phone hadn't done it automatically, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have been here right now myself. So don't worry, yeah, don't yeah, worry yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Me too, me too, but we have already uh, this night uh, uh, again um, uh, attacked missile, missile attack in west uh, of Ukraine and uh, the missiles uh, rounding around Kiev and, uh, at hours and because of this and time changing, so I'm glad I'm here with you. <laughs> well, so am I, so am I, Gregory, uh, certainly. All right. Well, we're we're currently on. We were on the topic of grain, um, 
I wonder if you have anything to add um, to this. I mean, it's, it's been an item of contention between our two people. Unfortunately, it's caused a huge rift uh, between us. Um, you know, we were, you know, they've done polls and uh, Ukrainians' uh, opinion of the polls has decreased significantly, if not even almost half. I mean, I think it was about 80% uh, in favor, uh, favorable uh, towards polls. But after this whole grain thing, I think it's fallen to below 50% favorable opinion of Polish people. Um, who's, who's pumping this rhetoric? Who, in your mind, when you look at this, 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 who's pumping this up that it's a Polish-Ukrainian issue rather than an issue, a money issue, really, is what it is? Huge yeah, financial yeah. interests. Yeah, yeah, this is a very, uh, very important question. This is a money question, so this is very complicated than our question. Between nations and between peoples and between economics, yeah, I know. But who's pumping this? You know the answer. Pumping this, uh, going this discussion uh, to, uh, to hard way, going this discussion with some uh, propagandic uh, slogans and words. You know who did this. And as I know, the Polish Security Service uh, arrested some people in Poland uh, who working for Russia's money, yeah, who, who working in this protest, near this protest, in this protest, to make this protest end, not 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 anti grain, uh, to make this to make this problem bigger. And yeah, this is Russia. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right, and your your picture is absolutely right. Yeah, it's, it's Russia, are, and unfortunately, unfortunately, there's also financial interests, not just Russian financial interests, but financial interests from giant retailers and distributors for whom this makes sense. It increases their margins. I mean, of course uh, they you know, jump on it. Yeah, you know, you know, guys, but, but look, 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 look what the point is. Uh, we are two civilized countries, two democratic countries. We have problems with grain, we will have problems with something else, with our meat, with I don't know what it, what it is. Yeah, but as two different, as the two democratic countries, we can discuss something and we can make the uh, decision together. But when the Russia come in this discussion, it's uh, taking some wood in this fire. And this is not a democratic wood. This is a propaganda wood in this fire. Oh yeah, and no, certainly. Uh, you can you can certainly see it. You can certainly see it, and especially because a lot of people, you know, they're on social media, and uh, Russia's become a very a, a very good operator in the social media sphere. They have a lot of trolls in there. They they jump on anything, you know, even even that whole thing uh, with the terrorist attack in Moscow. I mean, I think it was about an hour after the attack already. There were there were TikTok accounts uh, posting posting the video, but uh, putting Ukrainian flags on the shooters. I saw this with my own eyes, and they were running with it. I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. So. yeah, yeah. Russian propaganda is the most effective weapon of Russia's federation. It's more effective than Russia's army, than Russia's rockets, than Russia's aircraft. Yeah, Russian propaganda is the most effective Russian weapon at all. All right. Okay. Well, let's move to the, the, the next story. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll start uh, fresh uh, on the next uh, story, which is uh, the black sh Europe's of black sheep Hungary. Now, the scrutiny uh, on the ruling Fidesz party has intensified over corruption allegations fueled by former party stalwart uh, Peter Magyar's uh, revelations and uh, calling for accountability. Now, are we seeing potential shift in Hungarian politics? Uh, let's take a, a quick look at this report. Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has recently not been the European Union's favorite top official. His close ties with Russian President Vladimir Putin, along with his government's anti-Ukraine policy decisions, do nothing to help his reputation. 
Now, an audio recording leaked by opposition figure Peter Magyar is making the PM's domestic support plummet. Our country has sunk into the greatest political, moral and legal crisis since the change of the communist regime, covering up pedophile crimes, a pardoning scandal, corrupt executives and government members. The 43-year-old lawyer was once a close ally of the Orban's government. He rose to prominence recently after releasing an audio recording of a conversation with Judith Varga, who was both his wife and Hungary's justice minister at the time. The tape allegedly contains audio of Varga detailing an effort by aides linked to Orban's cabinet chief to alter documents in a high-profile graft case involving one Pal Volner. During Tuesday evening's protest in front of the parliament, he delivered a speech which came just hours after publishing the controversial recording on social media. Former Hungarian Justice Ministry State Secretary Pal Volner now finds himself at the center of corruption scandal. Charged in 2022 with accepting bribes from the former head of Hungarian Chamber of Judicial Officers, Volner maintains his innocence. But the stakes are high and prosecutors may still put the pair behind bars. The courtroom atmosphere also promises to be fairy and tense. In recent years, we saw Orbán's son-in-law taking ownership of more and more things in his own name. Because in 2022, when Fidesz and Viktor Orbán won a two-thirds majority for the fourth time, they thought that they could do anything. Volner's alleged acceptance of bribes has sent shockwaves through Hungary's political scene and leaves the Orbán government in very sensitive position ahead of European's parliament elections in June. All right. Well, I guess, Rostislav, we'll start with you, because I believe in Radio Free Europe, uh, you published an article uh, about this very thing. Um, tell us, who's, who's Peter Magyar? Who is this guy? Uh, his ex-wife was uh, the justice minister at the time that this all happened, I think. Um, who's she? And uh, give, us a, give us a little background here. Yeah, uh, Petr Magyar, he's a, a prominent Hungarian politician. Uh, if you can be a prominent politician, not being in the Orban's party, Fidesz, of course. That's one thing about uh, modern Hungary. Uh, he is rising star of Hungarian politics. He's in opposition now. He is young, uh, just over 40 years old, 43. And uh, he was married to the... Uh, uh, Judith Varga, she was a uh, Hungarian justice minister, uh, but then they divorced and he released this kind of tape recordings uh, implicating the ruling Fidesz party and uh, top uh, Hungarian officials in corruption. You know, uh, Viktor Orban has been in power in Hungary this time for uh, 14 years now, since 2010. Uh, 14 years in power, you know, it's quite long for the member of European Union country. And, you know, uh, power corrupts uh, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You know, uh, his, uh, Orban in Hungary is like uh, ruling like, like his own uh, uh, kingdom, uh, like a king of uh, Hungary, unopposed. He has no, almost no opposition. He, his party controls, uh, has almost constitutional majority in several uh, 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 Hungarian parliaments. But he also rules charismatically, doesn't he? I mean, he does have yeah. the support of, of the people. Yes, uh, he has support of the people because why? Because uh, uh, one of the reasons he has a uh, support, uh, and uh, according to social uh, 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 sociological polls, because he ha he has monopolized Hungarian uh, economy, his party monopolized Hungarian uh, mass media, especially. You know, mass media are extremely loyal. There is a young generation of Hungarian journalists who uh, know nothing uh, about uh, opposition. Uh, uh, who, who know nothing about how to be in, uh, in, uh, kind of conducting interview with opposing questions, with tough questions, you know, sharp questions, you know. It's, uh, Hungarian mass media are completely loyal, almost entirely completely loyal to Viktor Orban and, and his Fidesz party. Also, the dangerous tendency is that Orban is leaning towards Russia. Uh, Orban makes constantly uh, pro-Russian statements. He met uh, President uh, of Russia, uh, Putin in China recently, uh, he opposes uh, Western support and Western sanctions uh, uh, to Ukraine and uh, sanctions against Russia. He uh, now he he thinks about European election. Of course, in June, he, he said that his aim will be 
to, as he put it, occupy Brussels. Let's occupy Brussels, he said uh, to his supporters, to his uh, right wing, uh, you know, like uh, uh, partners in the other European countries. Oh, so Hungary is a really black ship in the in European Union. Now also there is another smaller black ship. It's Slovakia That's with right. uh, Robert Fico, also pro-Russian anti-Ukrainian politician. And did did so, Fico did Fico also congratulate Vladimir Putin on his election win or? Uh... Yes. Or was it just uh, Orban? Uh, the, I, I don't know whether Fitzo congratulated himself, but, but Orban did. And uh, he thinks that uh, Orban generally, his stance on the war is like that. Ukraine will not win. Russia will prevail anyway. Let's uh, not so let's be Ukraine. nice to Russia. I mean, uh, yeah, well, yeah. I mean. And let's let's press Ukraine into unfavorable peace deal with Russia. That's yeah. his stance. All right, Gregory, you got anything to say about this and uh, Orban? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. But look, look what we have: we have a pro-Russian politics that involved in great corruption in their country. Wow! What a surprise! <laughs> mm. Oh no, Gregory! Gregory cut off there. Well, uh, yeah, I was looking for... Oh, he's back. You're yeah. back. Okay, you cut off there for a yeah, second. Yeah, I'm back. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a surprise, I said, yeah? And, yeah. and, and philosophy, um, let's, let's look at philosophy. That's what Russia sell to authorities to, uh, uh, in, in other countries. If you pro-Russian politics in your country, you can do anything. You can corrupt anything. You can corrupt, build a corrupt country. Corrupt system. You can dance in naked on the rooftops. It's not that it does, this doesn't matter if you um, support Russia and Orban. It's the great symbol of this. When Orban uh, supports Russia, he can do anything in, in 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 his country. Yeah, and he do anything in his country. He built a corrupt country. He built a corrupt system, like Yanukovych in Ukraine. That's right, and, and you mentioned you mentioned dancing naked uh, on the rooftops. It does remind me. I think it was a couple of years ago that one of, uh, one of the guys from the Fidesz party, um, I believe, I believe he was an anti-gay activist, but he was actually a, he was found climbing a building naked, uh, running uh, running away from a from a, a gay orgy that he was at. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so, yeah, 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 the, the hypocrisy yeah, is very yeah. clear there. Yeah. Yeah, All but, right. but, 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 but that's not a democracy, yeah? That, that's not, and, or, and uh, um, Orban and Fizzo built in their country is not a democracy. It's a corruptocy, yeah? Because they built a corrupt country, they, they built a corrupt system in their country with the support of Russia, with the money, of, with the Russia's money, with the Russia's support, and, and, and that's the point, yeah? Uh, and, and that's what Russia tells the other authorities in other countries. Be with us and you can do anything in your country. Mm hmm. All right. Well, yeah, we'll, we'll have to look into that a little uh, more deeply. Uh, hopefully, maybe next, uh, maybe next week. Now, let's uh, move on to this other, other thing that's come out. A Euronews poll has revealed unexpected increase in support for a common European defense policy. Now, this uh, obviously reflecting concerns over Russia and U.S. US commitments to NATO. Uh, so let's take a quick look. Russia's war against Ukraine has served as a wake-up call for the European Union. Despite the fact that Ukraine experienced Moscow's aggression in the years leading up to the full-scale war, the EU didn't seem too bothered with the situation in the eyes of some. The latest Euronews poll reveals, however, that even the continent's most Eurosceptic voters are willing to support a common defense policy for the bloc. 26,000 voters in the EU shared their thoughts on the idea of pulling military capabilities in the survey. Most voters, however, are still in favor of bolstering the bloc's military capabilities rather than supplying Ukraine with more weapons, despite Kyiv's urgent demands for more equipment. Russia's main battlefield advantage right now is its extensive use of guided aerial bombs. The only way to counter these barbaric tactics is to shoot down the aircraft dropping the bombs, which requires a sufficient number of modern air defense systems on the front lines. Poland and Finland are the most committed to strengthening defensive capabilities, the poll shows. The latter became a NATO member last year, 
Poland, to show its commitment to the alliance, plans to spend 4% of its GDP on defense in 2024. It is necessary for all the countries of the alliance to increase their defense spending by 2 to 3% of their GDP. I will persuade our allies to do so. The Euro News poll comes just two months before the European Parliament decisions. It also shows that the far-left electorate is less keen on spending more money on the military, while the right-wing Eurosceptics and far-right identity and democracy voters are the most supportive of strengthening this area. So interesting news there. I mean, uh, a, a lot of Europeans uh, more and more are realizing uh, the kind of situation they're in. Um, but they're also looking at uh, sort of, I mean, Europe seems to be federalizing and they're looking at a, a federal a sort of a, a Europe-wide military. I wonder, well, why don't we start with you, Gregory? What do you, what do you think of that? And especially since, you know, Ukraine is on its way uh, to be a member of the EU. How would you look at, at something like that, like a European military? Guys, uh, I think this is a great idea. Uh, and I think uh, every idea that makes Europe stronger uh, in the defense uh, systems, in the uh, security systems, uh, that builds the new security power in Europe, it's a great idea. <clears throat> in NATO or uh, uh, parallel to NATO, all, this, all, all defense ideas in Europe is a great idea and spend more money for defense and build the uh, mi mi military factories it's the great idea not only for ukrainian support but first of all in this time in this year and the next year first of all it, it will do to, to support ukraine because ukraine is a fortress uh in this uh, in the head of the spare of a european spare and we're fighting russian right now uh, so uh, but for Europe, it's very important to build uh, actually um, independent from the United States and uh, European system of defense and European, maybe European armed forces, United Armed Forces. And this, I, I think it's a great idea. All right, Rostislav, um, any comments there? And uh, let, let's take a look at those numbers again. Obviously, uh, the country with a, that supports uh, this idea the least, Hungary, at 20% only. Any, any comments for this one? Generally speaking, uh, I also uh, in favor of European defense, uh, uh, spending more, Europe should spend more, Europe should uh, rebuild its uh, military industry, uh, uh, military complex, because Ukrainian war showed that Europe <laughs> can't deliver the simple things like artillery shells. Europe, pro European Union promised one million uh, uh, shells by April and delivered only half of it. It has no resources. That's how, you know, peaceniks in Europe made Europe almost undefensible. Secondly, uh, European uh, countries of NATO should spend more than 2%. Or some of them are not spending even 2% now. Majority of NATO, European members of NATO are not even spending 2% of their GDP on defense purposes, defense aims. They should, I, 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 I agree with Polish President Andrzej Duda, who said that recently that... Uh, they should spend not two but three percent of GDP because of Russian invasion and I know it's, a, it, it's crazy you know like a, a lot of people I mean I think they should be spending four I mean we have uh, a, a few countries at least the ones that are taking this seriously yeah. uh, the Baltic countries and Poland are taking this seriously but th there are still countries that haven't reached the two percent Absolutely, absolutely. And, but here is the, the one thing where the big elephant in the room, and the big elephant in the room is the United States of America. If uh, uh, Trump comes and with skepticism about NATO, about the European common defense and so on and so forth, Europe should be able to defend itself, not relying completely on America. Because now Ukraine, uh, Europe is completely under American security umbrella. But Europe should, should, be, should do more to be kind of autonomous and to be able to defend itself. But uh, America should be present in Europe. NATO should be strengthened. This European identity, European defense should not be done at the expense of NATO alliance because NATO is important, American presence in Europe is important, and Russian strategic aim is to push America out of Europe. 
kind of to de-Americanize Europe, you know, to leave Europe alone without America. The strength of Western alliance, the strength of the West is in unity between Europe, European countries, Europe and North America, uh, between America, Canada and European Union countries. So that's the strength of the West and that should be strengthened. So it's, European it's sure, defense... It certainly should. And, uh, and I mean, without NATO, I, I, don't, I don't see uh, the Europeans cooperating uh, like they have been. I mean, if, if Europe leaves, it's like uh, when the parents leave the children alone. I mean, the children start fighting and, and, and breaking things. Uh, it's, it's hard to say it that way, but it does, it does seem that way sometimes, you know? And uh, all right. Well, uh, as we're journalists, this is Press Corner. I wanted to just uh, quickly touch on a, a final topic. Uh, and now uh, that's the situation for journalists around the world, and particularly in Russia and Belarus. Now, here's a, a quick report. It was 29th of March, 2023. Yeah, and Ivan Gershkovich was performing his journalistic duties in the Russian city of Yekaterinburg. On that day, authorities detained Gershkovich on charges of espionage, a claim repeatedly denied by the journalist, the U.S. government and his employer. A year later, there has been no breakthrough in his case. And Gershkovich remains behind bars in Russia, a country known for its inhumane treatment of prisoners. We have a message for Evan Gershkovich and his family today, sir. Yes. Less than two weeks after his arrest, the U.S. State Department designated Gershkovich as wrongfully detained and called for his immediate release. But the wheels of justice have been turning slowly. The 32-years-old journalist has spent 12 months in Moscow's Lefortovo prison awaiting trial, which has been rescheduled for late June this year. Russia extended his detention after yet another sham hearing. In yesterday's hearing, the Russian authorities did not even provide any evidence of a crime. In fact, they have provided no real justification for holding him. That is because he has done nothing wrong. Journalism is not a crime. Despite Washington's failed attempts to bring Gershkovich home, his case is not forgotten. This week, journalists from various media outlets organized a rally in London to remind us of the need to speak about the WSJ employee. Gershkovich's detention, however, is not the first such move orchestrated by the Russian authorities against Americans. Ex-Marine Paul Whelan has been languishing behind the walls of a Russian prison for six years. I spoke on the phone with Paul Whelan. Um, our intensive efforts to bring Paul home continue every single day. And they will, until he and Evan Gershkovitz and every other American wrongfully detained is back with their loved ones. In addition to Willen and Gershkovich, Moscow has imprisoned Russian-American journalist Alsu Kumasheva and kept a Russian-American ballerina, Ksenia Karelina, under lock and key. All right, gentlemen. Unfortunately, we, you know, uh, we've been to, uh, we, we, really, uh, we really chatted it up. We've almost reached the end of the show, so we don't have much time to talk about this subject. So I wonder if you could just give us some final words. We'll start with you, Gregory, um, about the situation for journalists in Russia, and perhaps if you could tell us if you have any friends that are in Russia that are in danger. Uh, guys, uh, let's, let, let's make the clear view. There is no journalism in Russia. There is no freedom of speech in Russia. There is no free Russia's journalists, even in Europe. Yeah, and how many journalists uh, America have in North Korea? How many journalists NATO in Europe have, have in Soviet Union? So the situation is bad. There is no free place for a free journalist in Russia at all. So let's remember this and uh, let's make this uh, even case uh, like a sample of this. There is, it's, it's a very big risk for every journalist to be in Russia, even on vacation. Yeah, uh, and unfortunately, so does this with uh, some final words there. Yeah, Russia arrests uh, American citizens uh, or citizens uh, or people with double citizenship, and it uses as a human exchange material for uh, Russian uh, criminals who are in Western jails, like uh, you know. Uh, 
Victor Booth, who was arms dealer from Russia exchange recently, like uh, Krasnikov uh, spy who killed Chechen field commander uh, and now is in German jail. Russia arrests people and uses as a as a exchange material. That's the first thing. And second guy, yes, I agree that. Uh, almost all independent Russian journalists have left the country. Nothing remains there from uh, opposition or independent journalism in Russia. Uh, Russia designates uh, independent media as foreign agents or undesirable media, and it complicates their activity. People, uh, all uh, independent-minded uh, people, uh, are either uh, left uh, Russia or been suppressed uh, in Russia in jails or even killed. I wish we had more time to talk about this subject. I, I think uh, we should de designate one entire show for just uh, this subject. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to do that soon. Gentlemen, a pleasure to have you. Lovely to talk to you both. Uh, thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us. So, uh, please join us again next week, uh, Sunday, 11.15 Central European time. That's it for now.